infection. The concepts discussed in this presentation are local infections and systemic infections. A local infection would be like a wound infection. Symptoms or cues of a wound infection can include pain, warmth, edema, erythema, which is redness, and exudate. Exudate is the medical term for drainage, and the exudate will be increased and or purulent with an infection. Systemic infection will involve the entire body, and symptoms or cues can include fever and chills, or on the other extreme, a low body temperature. It can include oliguria, Oliguria is going to be a low urine output. Tachypnea, which is going to be rapid respirations. Tachycardia, which will be rapid heart rate. Nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. And some interrelated concepts would be inflammation and tissue integrity. Infection is defined as a disease state that results from the presence of pathogens, which are disease-producing microorganisms that are in or on the body. Well, in order for an infection to be present, we follow this infection cycle, and we have to have all six of these pieces involved or infection is not going to happen. We start off with that infectious agent, which can be a bacteria, virus, or fungi. We have a reservoir, which is where that organism is actually going to grow and multiply. Then we have to have a way for that infectious agent to get out of the reservoir. So we have to have a portal of exit. So it's a place of escape for the organism. Then we have to have a way for that organism to get from one host to a potential host. And this is going to be through direct contact, indirect contact, which will include a vector. A vector would be like a mosquito, the airborne route, or droplet. Then we have to have a way for that infectious organism to get into the new potential host. And that is going to be that portal of entry. And then the host has to be susceptible to that organism. Not only susceptible, that organism has to be able to overcome the resistance that is mounted by that host's immune system. Other definitions is going to be a low risk of transmission. This is going to be minimal to no risk to caregivers, but it can be serious in someone who is immunocompromised. An example would be pneumonia. Communicable disease will be a disease that can be transmitted directly from one person to another person. Symptomatic is an infection in which the pathogens multiply and cause clinical signs and symptoms or cues. Asymptomatic, and if you remember from medical terminology that A means absence of, Asymptomatic is an infection in which clinical signs and symptoms or cues are not present. So we have an absence of symptoms. And an example would be hepatitis C. Question, what is the most significant and commonly found infection causing agent in the healthcare institution?
The correct answer is bacteria. We need to look at the stages of infection. It's going to go through four different stages. The incubation period is when the organisms begin to grow and multiply. <coughs> Excuse me, they begin to reproduce. We have the prodromal stage where the person is going to be most infected. The client may have vague and nonspecific signs of the disease, and often they're even unaware that they are contagious. So at this point, they're not even taking precautions and the infection spreads pretty easily. The full stage of the illness is where the presence of specific signs and symptoms of the disease are very apparent. And the convalescent period is when the client recovers from the infection. Another question, during which stage of infection is the client most contagious? <coughs> the correct answer is the prodromal stage. Our body has some natural defense mechanisms in place one of which is going to be normal flora. Normal flora is bacteria that is normally found on or in the body, especially found in the gastrointestinal tract that help keep potentially harmful bacteria from invading the body and can also prevent some of that normal other normal flora from overproducing and causing an infection. Now, if the client is immunocompromised or if the normal flora of the body is disturbed, for example, with antibiotics, antibiotics we know are not always specific to the pathogen that they attack, and sometimes they kill that normal or good flora that keeps that harmful bacteria in check or some of that normal flora in check. And it allows some of that normal flora or other harmful bacteria then to proliferate or reproduce and it can overwhelm the body creating an opportunistic infection. So, Again, if the client is immunocompromised or if that normal flora is disturbed or there's a break in the skin and mucous membrane barrier or a suppressed inflammatory or immune response, infection can take over and create serious infections. The inflammatory response helps the body neutralize, control, or eliminate the offending agent or that infectious agent and prepare the site for repair. It's a normal response of the immune system. This inflammatory response occurs in response not only to infection, but also to injury. Uh, for example, think of spraining the ankle. We're going to have an inflammatory response as those tissues are repaired. Cardinal signs of inflammation include pain, heat, edema, erythema, remember this is redness, and loss of function that usually appear at the site of the injury and or infection. Inflammation can be acute or chronic. Uh, think of inflammatory bowel disease. This is a chronic inflammatory process. The response will occur in two different phases. First of all, we have the vascular phase where vasodilation increases the blood flow and we see the redness and heat we see histamine being released, which causes permeability of the vessels 
and protein-rich fluid to get to the site of injury. Then we have the cellular stage, where leukocytes and neutrophils begin to consume the debris from the injury, and exudate is then released. Damaged cells are going to be repaired, potentially resulting in scar tissue. Scar tissue is not always present after uh, an injury or infection. So the different types of exudate we see, if the drainage is clear, we call this cirrus. If the drainage is pink or red, or it just kind of looks like watery blood or it's kind of a pink tinge to it, we call this serosanguinous. If the drainage, the exudate is red, it's straight blood, then we call this sanguinous. And if there is pus in the exudate, this is purulent. So some of the labs that we look at that can actually demonstrate or show to us that we do have an infection would be our complete blood count or CBC. We're going to be looking at the white blood cell count. <clears throat> Excuse me. The normal um, is going to be, depending on the labs, because each lab is going to have slightly different, uh, is what we're going to be looking at. We're going to have an increased amount of those white blood cells. And we're also going to have an increase in specific types of white blood cells. We call this a shift to the left. Basically, what is we call that additional um, CBC information, the differential. And it's basically telling us the various white blood cells. We're going to start seeing an elevation in that differential portion of the CBC. Again, mostly white blood cells. We have an increased number of immature white blood cells. And when we have an increased number or that of the immature white blood cells or a shift to the left, then that indicates a potential infection because the mature ones are fighting the infection. So we're producing more white blood cells and they just haven't matured yet. We may see an elevated erythrocyte sedimentation rate, or ESR. This is an indicator of inflammation. We may see an elevated C-reactive protein, or CRP. This also indicates inflammation. And if we do a culture, we may find the presence of pathogens in different body fluids such as urine, blood, sputum, or drainage, the exudate from a wound. There's different things that can increase the risk of contracting an infection. That would be our pH levels. If they are abnormal, that increases the risk. If our body's white blood cells are not functioning appropriately, we have a low count, that can increase the risk. Our age, our gender, and hereditary factors or genetic factors. Have we been immunized, whether naturally or acquired? Do we have fatigue, the climate, our nutritional status and understand that protein helps the body heal. So someone who has an infection or an illness, we always want them to uh, increase the amount of protein they are in uh, eating. 
and their overall general health status. We do know that some disease processes will lead to immunodeficiency and increase the risk for infection. How stressed is the client? Prolonged stress can actually lower a client's resistance to infection. Have they had invasive or indwelling medical devices or procedures completed? That increases the risk. We do know that there is an increased risk in the older adult due to their decreased immune function and the fact that they're less capable of producing lymphocytes. And we do know that the older adult is also at an increased risk for having a poor nutritional status, an intentional weight loss, lack of exercise, poor social support, low serum albumin levels, the albumin would be the protein, and all of those can increase the infection risk. With infants, we have that immature immune system. With children, maybe there are some congenitive uh, or congenital disorders. With adults, it can be just due to an unhealthy lifestyle or obesity. Some preventative measures would be like having the pneumonia, influenza, RSV, and COVID vaccines, and teaching hand hygiene methods. Additional risks would include that low socioeconomic status, <clears throat> excuse me, or if they are at risk of being in that poverty level, then they have an increased risk of poor nutritional status and or a lack of immunizations. Maybe we have non-immunized individuals who don't have the capability of resisting some of these preventable diseases. Clients may have chronic illnesses and those chronic illnesses will compromise the immune system. They may have chronic drug therapies. Some clients are on maintenance steroids or maybe they're on chemotherapy. And clients that abuse different substances such as the recreational drugs or alcohol those can lead to poor nutrition. <coughs> Excuse me. And we need to talk about hospital acquired infections. This unfortunately happens quite often and basically the hospital acquired infections are caused by the hospital staff. In addition to the fact that there are a lot more infectious agents present in the hospital. So some of the specific causes is we have an invasive procedure. So once again, maybe it is the insertion of a medical device with inappropriate technique, or they've had a surgery which now creates a portal of entry for a potential pathogen. Maybe they're receiving antibiotics. And as discussed earlier, we know that antibiotics can disrupt the normal flora of the body. Maybe there is a presence of multi-drug resistant organisms. Those organisms can be transmitted <coughs> excuse me, to other clients, or there is a break in infection prevention and control activities. In other words, we're not performing appropriate hand hygiene or sterilization techniques. Implications of these HAIs include a significantly increased cost of healthcare, Extended hospital stays 
and prolonged recovery time. Examples of some of these HAIs include urinary tract infections, surgical or traumatic wound infections, respiratory tract infections, or infections of the bloodstream. And how do we prevent infection transmission? Well, we start off with standard precautions. We look at hand hygiene. This is one of the big ones. We should perform hand hygiene before touching a client or putting gloves on, before a clean or aseptic, aseptic is sterile procedure, after body fluid exposure, after touching a client or client surroundings, and after removing gloves. We should wear personal protective equipment if we anticipate splashing or sprays of body fluids. Respiratory hygiene is another part of standard precautions or cough etiquette, where we cover the mouth and nose with a tissue when coughing or sneezing, then promptly dispose of that uh, tissue, or we cough or sneeze into the elbow, and then, of course, wash the hands. We should also wear a surgical mask if there are coughs or other respiratory symptoms. And maintain a three foot distance if we have a cough or other respiratory symptoms. Safe injection practices are also part of their standard precautions where we do not recap a needle if able we should activate that safety device after the needle has been used. And if recapping is necessary, use that one-handed scoop method of recapping. Don't use both hands. And properly dispose of those sharps and needles in the needle boxes. And then we should definitely review room assignments carefully. If it is a semi-private room, then making sure we're not putting clients with someone who would be susceptible to an infection that one of those clients may have. Transmission-based precautions would be our airborne precautions. So clients that have tuberculosis or the chickenpox or the measles infections, that are spread through the air. These clients should be put into a private room with negative air pressure with the door closed. You should always wear a respirator, which is that N95 mask when in the client's room, and the client should wear a mask when they're out of the room. Droplet precaution would be for disease processes like rubella, mumps, diphtheria, or the adenovirus. These clients should be also in a private room, but the door can remain open. We should wear personal protective equipment when in the room and we expect to be touching the client. The client will wear a mask when they're out of the room and we should definitely maintain that three foot distance from the infected person when possible. We have contact precautions. This would be for those multi-drug resistant organisms. These clients should be in a private room if possible, and we should definitely wear the PPE when we are expecting client contact, and that PPE needs to be removed before we leave the client's room, and then we wash our hands. We should limit client movement outside of the room, and we should avoid caring or sharing those patient care equipment. In other words, they should have a thermometer that is designated just for them, blood pressure cuff just for that client, stethoscope just for that client, etc. And then we have neutropenic precautions, which this is going to be kind of on the opposite spectrum 
the client does not have an infection, but they have a low neutrophil count, and that makes them extremely susceptible to infectious organisms. So basically, we're preventing infection transmission to that susceptible client. These are often clients like uh, those that are undergoing chemotherapy or potentially have leukemia, for example. We also call this reverse precautions or isolation. These clients need to be in a private room and anytime we enter that room, we should put PPE on prior to entering the room. And again, we avoid sharing those patient care items like the thermometer or blood pressure cuff stethoscope. These clients should not be allowed to have fresh flowers or live plants in the room because they do harbor bacteria. They should not have any fresh fruits or vegetables. All of their food should be cooked because fresh fruit and vegetables can also harbor bacteria. Visitors that have infectious symptoms should not visit these clients. And a mask should be on the client anytime they are out of the room. Question, true or false? In most situations, alcohol-based hand rubs are more effective at reducing bacterial and viral accounts on the hands of the healthcare personnel than antimicrobial soap. This is actually true, and you can pause it here if you want to read this um, rationale. The One of the most important things to remember is if the client has C. difficile, you must use soap. The hand sanitizer will not be sufficient. Another true or false, soap and detergents, non-antimicrobial agents, are considered adequate for routine mechanical cleansing of the hands and removal of most transient microorganisms. This is true. So we don't have to always use the antimicrobial soaps to get rid of those uh, potentially infectious pathogens. Just regular soap is usually sufficient. Another true or false. Standard precautions should be used when caring for a non-infectious post-operative client who is vomiting blood. This is true. We always use standard precautions. I don't care if they're vomiting blood or not. Anytime we touch the client, we should be using standard precautions.